good morning and welcome to North Conway. We're glad that you've joined us for the morning worship service and we give special welcome today to our fathers. Happy Father's Day and uh, we're glad that you are here today. We've got a busy morning. We'll just keep right on going. You listen quickly and I'll try to continue quickly. Uh, just give you welcome. Those who are our guests today, let me uh, share with you, if you would, to pick up a connection card that's there in the pew in front of you. And if you would, fill that out sometime during the morning service. And then as you exit, there's uh, the offering boxes that are at each of the exits as you go out. Just take that completed form, stick it in there. Helps us to get to know you better. Also gives us an opportunity to be able to give you a free gift just as a way to say thank you for joining us uh, for worship at uh, North Conway Baptist Church. Well, listen, it's going to be a, a big day, uh, Father's Day. I know many of you have plans as far as that is concerned, but also Vacation Bible School starts today. That's kind of unusual uh, because generally we're uh, coming down to the conclusion of Vacation Bible School on Father's Day, but uh, uh, 2020 and 2021 being as it is, we had to adjust the schedule, and so it begins tonight, 6 o'clock, and uh, we have... Uh, classes that are available. Uh, you still have time to register your children. I think you can do it online as far as that is concerned. Tonight at 6 o'clock, children will be gathering in the fellowship hall, and we're looking for a great week, a full week of Vacation Bible School. So you'll be in prayer for Miss Sherry and all of her volunteers and teams that are in place for Vacation Bible School. Speaking of teams, I want to encourage you to go by, uh, there, by right across from the Welcome Center, which is directly behind me as you head out this direction. Uh, we have the sign up for the Love Grow Serve Reach. A couple of Sundays ago, uh, we had Ministry Sunday. Many of you signed up for ministries, and I want to encourage you that uh, remind you that we were starting with a clean slate. So, uh, if you were currently serving on a team, make sure if you want to continue to serve on that team to sign up for that, so that we have you down. We'll be working on those the next couple of weeks, putting all of those ministry volunteers into place to help us to be able to do what we need to do as a ministry at church. So keep that uh, in mind. Well, listen, it is a wonderful day and a good day when we have the opportunity to make, dedicate children to the Lord. I'm going to ask Brad and Andrea if you would come with Mr. Riker Lee, if you'll join me right here. Just what is a child dedication, just so that we understand. Uh, it's not, uh, we're not baptizing the child, we're not christening the child, all of those terms you may hear. It's a baby dedication, a child dedication. The biblical principle for this comes from 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a lady by the name of Hannah who prayed for a child. She was childless. The Lord answered her prayer, and when the Lord answered her prayer and gave her a child, she said this, For this child I prayed... And the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Baby dedication is simply living out that principle of Scripture, which reminds us that children really do not belong to us. Uh, we are custodians. We are stewards of those children. And God has blessed this couple with Mr. Riker, and uh, we're thankful for that. But uh, he ultimately belongs to the Lord, as do all of our children. And God has placed us in our place as mother and father to love them and to care for them in the place of the Lord. And that's a great responsibility. And we need the Lord's direction and strength to be able to do that. And today is a promise before the Lord that Brad and Andrea are giving and saying, we understand that. And we're going to do what God has called us to do. But I'm also going to give a charge to the church, to all of you here this morning. And uh, you'll hear that part because you are responsible as well. You're going to be teaching this boy in vacation Bible school and Sunday school and in discipleship classes and in RAs and those kind of things. So you're going to have a great part in teaching him the truths of God's word. So we'll have a charge to you as well. All right. We get to the part and I say, if we say we do, you'll say we do. Yes, sir. Do you, Brad and Andrea, promise in the presence of God, your friends and family, and this church body to do your best to instill in your child the values and teaching that will lead him to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you promise daily to pray for your child? Do you promise to entrust your child to God's care and to offer him to God for his service and ministry 
If so, say we do. We do. Family and church, to you friends and members of North Conway Baptist Church, do you promise to commit your time, resources, and prayer to assist Brad and Andrea in raising Mr. Riker Lee in such a way that he will come to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and grow to desire to serve God? If so, answer, we do. Yeah. Very good. We're going to have a time of prayer. I'm going to ask the family if they would, any that would like to join them and gather around them for prayer, if you come right now. It just simply helps us to recognize that uh, we need a church family, but you need a family around you, and they need these. These have been praying for them and encouraging them, and uh, it's this family that's going to assist them, and uh, we're thankful. Let's have a word of prayer together. Let's pray together. Father, for this day, we are thankful, and Lord, we are thankful for this occasion that brings this family together. Lord, we're thankful for Brad and for Andrea, their relationship with you. And Lord, we pray that you will lead them and guide them in the days ahead, that they will fully surrender the Lord Jesus in all areas of their life, that they will be the mom and the dad that you've called them to be, living out the principles of the Scripture before Mr. Riker. And Lord, we pray for Mr. Riker Lee, that even right now, that Lord, your Holy Spirit is drawing and calling him to yourself. Father, I pray when he comes to that age of accountability, when he is old enough to understand that he's a sinner before God, that he's a Savior, that when he's old enough to understand, the Holy Spirit will convict him of his sin, draw him to Jesus, and that he will have an obedient, listening voice, that he will hear the Spirit of God, and he will say, yes, Lord. And now, Lord, we claim for him right now to be a part of the kingdom of God, and we pray for that day when he trusts Jesus as his Savior. Then we pray that you'll help him to surrender his life to Jesus the remainder of his days, that, Lord, he may follow you fully. We give him to you. He's yours. And, Lord, this family, this couple, give him to you. And, and Lord, we pray that you will use him in a great and powerful way in the days ahead. Bless us as a church family as we care for children such as this. Father, I pray that we'll be a church family that teaches the truths of God's Word, that we'll always have Sunday school teachers and we'll always have vacation Bible school workers. We'll always have those folks working in the nursery who invest their lives in teaching the next generation to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and to follow them. And Father, I pray that you'll help us to be a church that supports the family, Lord, that helps to see our children, every single one of them, not one of them to be lost, not one, not one, not one to be lost, but every single child that comes under our care will hear the gospel, receive the gospel, live in the gospel, and that, Lord, they will become fully committed disciples of Jesus Christ. Let that be our legacy. Let that be our history. Let that be what you call us to be and to do. Bless this family in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we give them to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a gift for you, and uh, right there, Miss Sherry has that, and it's in there for you. We give that to you today. God bless you. Thank you. You can Thank be seated. You. Well, we're going to continue. I'm going to ask all fathers, if you are a father here today, would you do something? Would you quickly get up right now and come right back? These guys have just left. They're going to come right back here. <laughs> Drop off the children. Come on, guys, come on. Gather around here. Just gather around the altar. And if you will, face out this direction, but get shoulder to shoulder. Come on, guys. Let's go. Gather in. You can get up on the stage as well. If some need to go there, follow right up on the stage. Come on, guys. Gather right in. Go up on the stage. I know some of you don't want to do that, but keep going. Go right up that way. Go right up there. Go right up the stage, guys. Fill it up right there. Come on. There they go. Brother Jim. <laughs> What's that? All right, you got me? I hope so. Anyway, I got loud enough. All right. If you guys can push in around the edge there, push right on around, fill up the stage up there. There's plenty of space. I guess the stage is like the front pew. I don't know. They don't want to sit on that, but anyway. All right. All right, now, you ladies take it in. <laughs> Y'all could be going ooh and all ah right now. That would be good. Ooh, ah, there you go. 
They swooned you one day, did I not keep swooning you? Well, listen, we are thankful for our fathers, and uh, we bless you in Jesus' name today, and we are thankful for you. And uh, what a good-looking group. Is that not just a... Give my hand clap, I'm telling you. And we appreciate these men. A, a, a church is built upon the foundation of godly men. That's biblical, folks. That's biblical. Ladies, we love you, but the foundation's built on men of God. And I'm thankful for these men, many that I have known now for 15 going on 16 years. I'm thankful for you, appreciate you, glad to know you, glad to call you brother, glad to call you friend, and uh, we want to bless you today. We're going to pray for these guys. Ladies, I want you to join with us in praying with them, just simply a prayer of dedication upon them that God would bless them, our dads, granddads, and great-granddads. Do I need great-greats? Got great ones. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for these men. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your blessings upon them. Lord, I thank you for the blessings that come upon our church because of the faithfulness of these men who love the Lord, who serve the Lord, and Lord, who give themselves to the Lord and set a proper example before their children, their grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And Father, I pray that all of their children, all of their grandchildren, great-grandchildren will follow in their steps to follow Jesus fully all the days of their life. Father, we pray for these men that you protect them, Lord, that you would put your grace upon them. You fill them with your spirit. Lord, we pray that they will be continue to fight the good fight of faith. The devil never wants to give up, and the devil keeps going, and it's never give up, never give up, never give up. Keep fighting to the last moment to live for the Lord. Father, I pray that you would encourage them. Lord, I know that there's a burden on the hearts of probably many of these fathers for their children, their grandchildren, great-grandchildren, who may not be following the Lord. Father, I pray that you'd help them to be faithful in prayer, dedicated to the Lord, and that, Lord, to the dying breath that they have, that they'll do everything they can to see that every single one in their family knows Jesus and follows them into the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for these men. Bless them. Watch over them. Lord, may their tribe increase. May, Lord, may you continue to bless them and guide them in the days to come. And, Lord, we give them praise today on this Father's Day. We appreciate them. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, before you go, right here on the front pew, and if for some reason we run out, you just let me know. We'll do that. But there's a free gift for you. If you'll take one per dad, don't take one to dad. Just if you're here, uh, you take one. <laughs> and uh, if you'll take a free, just come right now. Just file. They're right here in these baskets right across this front pew. And if you'll do that, guys, you can head back to your seat. Right there. All right. All right, there they go. Now, don't be opening and play with it in church. <laughs> <laughs> There they go. See you later. There you go. Ernie, just hold that up right. Very good. Out. We're going to have to sing just a moment. I, telling these guys not to open it just reminds me of a story. Uh, they, what they have is uh, a pocket knife. <laughs> and I remember the first pocket knife that I gave my son on Christmas morning. Later that morning, we spent the morning in the emergency room. So <laughs> just saying, just be careful. All right. We're going to stand to sing. Let's stand to sing. Let's stand to sing.
Let's pray together. Well, as we come into your presence, we do give you thanks for your amazing grace. We are here today by that grace, and Lord, we give you thanks for it. For I am thankful for the grace that you extended to my life. Godly mother and a godly father brought me to the house of the Lord faithfully every time the door house was open. Faithful Sunday school teachers that I had who taught me the word of God. Mother and a father who prayed for me, my dad, until his dying day, and my mom until you called her to the Lord. I stand today saved by the grace of God because I had parents who brought me to hear the truth of God's word who lived out the gospel message in front of me. And I knew that Jesus was real in their life. And I wanted him to be real in my life. Thankful that for a mom and dad took me to a revival service when I was six years old. And I walked the aisle of that service and gave my life to Jesus. I owe my soul to the Lord Jesus Christ who saved me, but to a mom and dad who lived out Jesus before me. Father, I pray that for myself, my four children, and my grandchildren, and I live out faithfully the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ until the day I die and never turn back. Never follow back in the ways of the world. For every father here today, I pray the same for them. Father, I pray for every child that will be here tonight in Vacation Bible School. Or this could be the week, the time, when many of these children are brought into the kingdom of God as they trust Christ as their personal Savior. And Lord, that's what we're praying for. Pray for every teacher, every volunteer, every person will have and they look at every child and do everything that they, they do, but they do it with eternity in mind, that we are wrestling against the forces of evil arrayed against us. Then the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ, that we'll see children come to faith in Christ, follow him as disciples of Jesus all the days of their life. Well, we pray for a mighty pouring of the Holy Spirit in this week. Thank you for this opportunity to be in the house of the Lord today. We give you praise, honor, and glory in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Time for kids' worship, and so you'll head out right now. Miss Sherry is over here. You may be heading out the back as well. While they're going, take your Bibles, if you will. Turn to the Gospel of John, Gospel of John chapter 4. Gospel of John chapter 4, beginning in verse 43. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 43. Again, a brand new series of messages last Sunday entitled, I Need a Miracle, looking at the miracles that are recorded in the Gospel of John. The reason we're looking at those is there are a lot of unique miracles in the Gospel of John that are not included in the other synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so we're looking at these that are unique to the Gospel of John. John calls these miracles signs. Uh, he says that these are things that we look at and they, the miracles that Jesus performed helped for us to be able to see the deity of Jesus, his power, his majesty, who he is, uh, given an unveiling of that he is the son of God. So they are signs, they're pointers if you want to put it that way, because what a sign does, points us in a direction. And so as we look at these signs, these miracles, uh, the focus upon them is not so much the miracle itself as to, but, but to where the miracle leads us to. And each of these miracles leads us to Jesus. And we're in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 43, and a miracle about a father and his son. And let's read it together. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 43. After the two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see the signs and the wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him, all that his, told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he came down from Judea to Galilee. Parents will go to all kinds of extremes for their children, especially when they are sick. There's a movie entitled John Q. You may have seen it. It's by the lead character is Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington portrays a father whose son collapses at a ball game and is in a critical condition, this son, because he is now in need of a heart transplant. He goes to have that done, goes to his doctor, but his insurance company will not pay for the procedure. Therefore, the son is going to die. Denzel Washington, the character, goes to the local hospital, goes in with a gun, and holds the hospital hostage so that his son is able to get a heart. And uh, that's what the, the premise of the father and son does, give a, give a heart. But it's about, you know, just, just what a father will do. I don't know how many of you saw this week, or uh, I think it's been in the past week. Uh, did you see about the, um, the cable car that fell in Italy? I don't know if you have followed that. About a week ago, there was a cable car that went up a mountain in Italy. Uh, it, uh, there's a video of it. It, it. I just, I will tell you up front, it's disturbing. Uh, not for its graphic nature, but just because you, you, this is real time, people. And it shows a cable car coming up the mountain, steep up the mountain. And just before it gets to the landing, you, you've been on those before. It kind of makes that little, little swing a little bit. And you see it come there, the cable breaks, and then you just watch on the video as this cable car just goes, I mean, shooting down the mountain, and then it comes to the end, and it wrecks, kills everybody on board but one. 
who was spared was a little boy. He's in critical condition, but he has survived. You know how they found him? They found him wrapped in the arms of his father. And I thought about that as I watched that video of going down there of that father, that instinct to just knowing that this is not going to turn out well, grabbing his son, shielding him and holding him before they make that plunge and hit the bottom and everybody's killed. This nobleman has that same kind of sentiment about his son. He loves him. His son is sick. His son is dying. And this man who is an official, he works in the, probably in the household of King Herod. Uh, he is, uh, would be com, com, like a, uh, someone who would be like working in the cabinet of the president, that kind of thing. He has a high position. So this is a man of means. This is a man of wealth. This is a man of power. And yet he has no power over the health and life of his son. Realizing that his son is dying, if something is not done, he hears about Jesus. And so he makes about a 20-mile walk, hoofing it, and goes to see Jesus as Jesus returns to Galilee. What I want to be able to see in this passage of Scripture is four simple things about faith that we see of this father and how that God moves him. Here's our, here's our key truth, and this is what I want you to understand this morning. The Lord wants to move you from a crisis faith that only seeks to solve your problems to the mature, saving faith of eternal life. God wants to move us from a crisis faith in which we simply go to God and say, God, give me these things. Work out these problems. God, I want you to do this in my life. If you could only straighten this up, if you could only do this for my child. God wants to move us from that crisis faith to a faith that moves to trusting the Lord Jesus Christ for the greatest crisis that we have, and that is our eternal souls and the eternal souls of our children. So I want us to see this uh, in this passage of Scripture of how God works in the faith of this nobleman who comes to Jesus. Four things I want us to see. First of all, there's the occasion for the miracle. You may want to write this down. I want us to see the prompting of faith, the prompting of faith. What was the occasion? What was God doing here to lead this man to this occasion where the son is going to be healed, and not only that, but this man in his household is going to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ? Well, what's the occasion? Well, first of all, first circumstance is that Christ was returning to an area where he had been before. John tells us that Jesus is returning to Galilee. He's been there before. If we're, now, we're not, we're not going through the book of John chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but if you go back and you read the context, here's what's happened. In John chapter 2, where we were last week, Jesus went to Cana of Galilee, where he performed his first miracle by turning the water into wine. So when Jesus leaves Cana of Galilee, he travels north. He goes to the city of Jerusalem. He goes to the temple, and there's where he cleanses the temple. You know, he drives out the money changers, and he says, you know, you've made this a, you know, a den of thieves. And so Jesus cre creates quite a stir in Jerusalem so that everybody, who is this guy who has the audacity to go into the temple and turn things upside down? Well, he, he, he can because Jesus said, this is my house. What are you doing, all this mess here? And so Jesus has created quite a stir in Jerusalem. And there were some people from Cana of Galilee, where Jesus had performed the miracle previously, who were in Jerusalem. And so not only have some heard about the miracle of the water turned to wine, but they've seen Jesus in Jerusalem turning over the money changers and cleansing the temple. And so like, well, who is this guy? And so word is starting to spread in their community. Well, Jesus leaves Jerusalem. And well, before he leaves Jerusalem in John chapter 3, he meets with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is the ruler of the Jews. John chapter 3, and Jesus leads this man to saving faith in Christ. John 3, 16 is in that passage of Scripture. So Jesus leads to faith, personal relationship with the Lord, Nicodemus. Then in John chapter 4, Jesus goes back north and he goes to Samaria. There he meets the woman at the well. So he's led Nicodemus to faith in Christ, who's a Jew. Now he leads to faith in Christ a woman who was a Samaritan. And he meets her at the well, shares the gospel with her. And so now Jesus is leaving Samaria, and he's going back to Galilee, where he's been previously, where he performed his first miracle, that is turning the water to wine. So Jesus is returning to an area where he has been before. And he tells us why. He says, notice what he says. He says, they have no, there's no honor for me in my hometown. Jesus is from the Nazareth, Galilee area. And the reason he says there's no honor here, he says, they, they've heard about me. They've heard about the miracles, 
but I've not led anybody to faith here. I've led Nicodemus to faith in Jerusalem. The woman at the well, she's a Samaritan, but there's no one in the Galilee area who has yet come to honor me as, by, as the personal Savior. So he says, I'm going back there because there's some folks there that I believe that I can minister to and that God can meet them. So he's going back to an area where he's been before. There's another reason for this miracle. Number two, Jesus is going there because of the fulfillment of Scripture. The fulfillment of Scripture. Galilee is north of a beautiful area, uh, just beautiful. Uh, one of the most garden spots of the world, uh, all around the Sea of Galilee. If you ever tri make a trip to Israel, uh, you'll go into the Galilee area. Uh, just a beautiful area. And the Bible, there was a prophecy in the book of Isaiah chapter 9 that talks about that when the Messiah comes, that the Messiah was specifically going to go to the area of Galilee. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 13, 16 says this, quoting from Isaiah chapter 9, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadows of death, a light has dawned. There were a lot of Gentiles, a lot of non-Jewish people lived in the Galilee region. Even today, there's a lot of non-Jewish people who live there. And so the Bible prophesies in the book of Isaiah that the Messiah, when he come, would go to Galilee where he would shine the light. You see, Jesus never just came for the Jews. The Bible's not just about saving the Jews. It's always been about the world. So now we see Jesus leaving the faith in Christ, a Jewish man, a Samaritan woman, and now he's going to a land that's filled with Gentiles. People, this man who's a nobleman is not Jewish. And Jesus is going there fulfilling prophecy that he would share the scriptures in this area. Then there's the third reason why Jesus is in this area occasion. Because God has allowed a crisis to lead a father to saving faith. God has allowed a crisis to lead this father to saving faith. Why is this man looking for Jesus? Because he's got a problem. How'd you come to faith in Jesus? Were you just walking along one day and it happened? I dare say if we heard the testimonies of many of you in this building this morning, the testimony for many of you would go like this. There was a difficulty, there was a problem, there was a crisis going on in my life. Maybe it was a personal crisis, maybe it was a family crisis, whatever it is, some difficulty that spoke to you. Maybe you had been in church previously in your life, but God began to speak into your life about a particular problem, and it drew you back to the church maybe you grew up in. You went back and you heard the gospel. Maybe you didn't hear it when you were young, but now because there's a particular sharp need in your life, you begin to search out for God and say, maybe I need God in my life. Maybe I need him to help me to build this marriage. Maybe I need God to help me raise these kids. Maybe I need God to help me with these problems. And so there's a crisis. Why do crises come? For that very thing. God loves you enough that he will create pain and difficulty in your life so that you get outside of your comfort zone, so you start realizing that you're not in control of your life, so that you start going to a resource that's greater than you. This sickness has come into this family of this nobleman, and he's got a problem that he can't solve. But he's heard about someone that possibly can. I don't think that he at this point knows exactly who Jesus is other than he's a miracle worker. He's done some things. He's got some power. Maybe there's something there. I don't think he has a full theological understanding that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's no indication that he knows this here. He's just got a problem and he's looking for something. And he goes to what he's heard about. And that's what brings Jesus here. By divine appointment. Maybe you're here today by divine appointment. There's a problem or difficulty that's coming to your life that you can't handle. And there's nobody maybe in this room that knows about it other than you and your own heart and your own mind. But you're not here by chance. You didn't get here of your own free will. You got here because there's a God who pinched you a little, who began to speak to your heart and say, listen, maybe Maybe you do need something. Maybe there is something about this gospel. Maybe there is something about this Jesus. Maybe there is something about 
the gospel that this church is preaching that I need to hear maybe today. For this very reason, you're here today, my divine appointment, the occasion. There's the prompting of faith. Secondly, not only is there the prompting of faith and the occasion for it. Secondly, there's the obstacles of the miracle. There's the obstacles of the miracle. There's some things that always come up. Write this down, the problem of faith. We've got the prompting of faith. Now we've got the problem of faith. The Bible tells us that this man makes the journey. He goes, he's from Capernaum. He goes to Cana of Galilee where he hears that Jesus has gone by there. And so he comes, he comes there. And he comes to him and he says, he says, look at verse 47. He says, heal my son for he was at the point of death. Do you, does it seem a little maybe straightforward, maybe a little harsh? That here you have this father who is pleading for his son, and he's coming to Jesus, and he's like, Jesus, heal my son. You know, I've got this problem. You know, come. And Jesus says to him, and he's not only saying it to him, it's in the plural. Jesus is saying to everyone that's there because there's a crowd that's gathered. Look at verse 48. So Jesus said to him, unless you, you there is plural, it means Everybody who's gathered here, hear my voice, Jesus says. He says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. <laughs> why, why, well, Jesus, why are you putting this guy off? You know, why, why don't you, you know, he, he's got a need. Why don't you just meet it? Well, first of all, this guy really doesn't know what his need is. You see, his need is not just simply to have his problems solved. His need is not simply for his son who is dying to now live. That's, that's just fixing a temporary thing. The problem that's wrong with this father is that he doesn't know the Lord. That's his biggest problem. So Jesus has got to lead him there. You know, the, the prompting is the crisis and the illness, but that's not the kind of faith that's going to change this man's life. It's just the starting of it. And so Jesus begins to, he wants them to be able to start overcoming some of the obstacles there. Well, well, what's the biggest obstacle? Because this guy, the biggest obstacle, this guy has got a, an idea that if I see it, then I'll believe it. If I see it, I'll believe it. Got to be a sign. That's what these people are looking for. They were looking for signs. Well, you know, if, if God is real, you know, if, he, he really, if there is a God like you bunch of Christians say, whatever, why, why doesn't he just tell us? Why doesn't he just give some sign? Why does he just not write it in the sky? Why does he not give some, you know, uh, you know, speak to me directly, give me some miracle, do something in front of me, just do something? Because if I see it, if I, you can give me absolute proof, then I'll believe it. But you see, the problem is not proof. The problem is, is that for those who have this so-called intellectual thing about not believing in a God, it's not, it's not the proof. It's the rebellion. It's the will. It's they will not. You notice we say, it's easy, they will not believe. What God is saying is that if I were to give you a sign, you still wouldn't believe. You'd come up with some excuse. You'd have some scientific thing. Is that not what the world does? <laughs> I mean, we have around us the evidence that God has created the world. All that is here, all that is present in front of us. And what do we come up with? Well, you know, I know we have the sun and the moon and the stars and all the intricacy of the universe and all the things that go here. And uh, so, no, it, God couldn't have created this. It's got to have come through some evolutionary process over millions and trillions and billions of years and that's how it came about and you know kind of transitioned from this to this and God and what and everything that we is, we see comes by time and by chance so therefore there is no God and yet the universe cries out order design that someone created it God is never going to give you enough evidence to believe in him until you're willing to turn from your rebellion and turn from your sin and turn from ro ruling and controlling your own thing and trying to call the shots. Here's what he does. That's what he's doing. He comes to Jesus. I've got a problem. You come down to my house. Here's what I want you to do. 
you come to my house because if he says because if he can have Jesus to come to his house he can see Jesus in front of him to heal his son this is what he's saying is that Jesus this is this, this is how I know you work you work when you come there and you directly come to my son if you touch him then he can get better not realizing that he is speaking to the God of the universe the omnipotent omniscient omnipresent son of God who doesn't have to make the 20 mile journey to his house Jesus can just speak the word wherever he is and things can happen miracles can happen you see it's not if I see it I believe it it is with God faith is I believe it then I will see it I believe God I believe that he had made the universe. I believe that his son Jesus is the son of God. I believe that he died upon the cross of Calvary. I believe that he is the eternal son of God who rose again from the dead, who paid the debt of my penalty of my sin on the cross of Calvary. I believe it. And then you will see and understand and know that he is the eternal son of God. And you will begin to see as God begins to work and change your life and to change your heart. Quit coming to God saying, show me. What you're saying is, God, do it on my terms. Do it on my terms. Think about how insulting that is to God. Here, you got some fathers here today. Suppose I said to my teenage son, but she's 26 now, not going to have a teenage son, but he would suppose. He's 15, 16 years old. I'm going, well, you know, you've grown up and you've got some responsibility. Tell you what I'm doing. I have, I have gone to the bank and I have opened up a checking account for you and I have deposited $1,000 in that account for you. It's there. All you have to do is to be able, here's a card, here's a debit card. You can use this. You know, you be responsible. Use it in a good way. It's for you. Well, Dad, I, I don't know. Have you got the deposit slip? Show me, I, want, I want to see the evidence of how you opened up this account. And maybe we should go to the bank and I should stand, you know, that, you know, that you actually came in here and that I need to see, you know, from the bank's account that the money is real there, really there before I... What is wrong with you? I told you I opened an account for you and I put in $1,000 there. Believe it. And then you will see it. No, I got to see it before I believe it. Seeing it before you believe it is insulting God and saying to him, I want you to do it on my terms. You show me, I want the evidence, lay it down in front of me. And when I know it, it's interesting if you go back in the context, go back to John chapter 4. And go back into verse 40. This has happened immediately before Jesus goes to Galilee. We're talking about the obstacle of faith, the problem of faith. The, Samaritan, the woman who was saved at the well in Samaria, she goes back home and tells her family, and all the people of that area start streaming out to see Jesus. I want you to notice that these are Samaritans. These are not, they're half Jewish, half something else. They, have, they worship, they have a false religion. And yet, when they see Jesus and are confronted with them, notice what it says in verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, that's Jesus, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two more days. And many more believed. How did they believe? Look at verse 41. How did the Samaritans, who didn't have the law, who were not Jewish in background, who didn't have all of the Old Testament laws, who worshipped a false religion, but when they were confronted with Jesus standing there in front of him, them, and the woman at the well was not led to faith by some miracle, she just simply heard the word of Jesus and trusted him as her Savior. She comes back and tells the Samaritans, these are not religious folks. And many more believe, verse 41, because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. 
What do you need today to overcome your problem of faith? To overcome your problem of faith is that you simply need to go, this is the word of God. God has said it. I believe it. And then as you believe it, you will begin to see the power and the work of this believed word beginning to work out in your life. Not I got to see it. Not prove it to me. Not God come to me on my own terms. But God, I come to you on your terms. And that is to surrender my will, my actions to you and to say, Lord Jesus, I believe you. I trust you. I accept what you say. And when you do that, you open the windows of heaven into your life by that kind of faith. There's the occasion, there's the obstacle. Then thirdly, not only is there the obstacle to the miracle, but there is the operation of the miracle. Number three, write this down. The process of faith. The process of faith. What happens in this man's life once Jesus says to him, verse 49, the official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said, Go. Your son will live. I don't have to go to your house. <laughs> I don't have to go touch anybody. I don't have to, I don't have to go on your schedule. I don't have to leave. I don't have to, I don't have to walk 20 miles to go to your house. It's done. Jesus said, Go. Your son will live. The man, that's what happens here. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went on his way. You don't want to know what biblical saving faith looks like? Here it is. Look at the steps. Number one, he heard the word of God. He heard the word of God. How does God begin to work in your life when saving faith, when genuine faith in God begins to work in your life? You hear the word of God. That's the reason you need to be under the preaching and the teaching of God's Word. You need to be under the preaching of God's Word when the pastor stands before you with the Word of God open and preaches to you like I'm preaching this morning. You need to hear the Word of God because it is the hearing of God's Word that opens the doorway of faith into your life. You've got to hear the truth. Hear the truth. Hear the truth. Hear the truth. You can't hear the truth when you're not present for preaching. You're not, you can't hear the truth when you're not present for Bible study. You've got to hear the truth. He heard the word of Jesus. Jesus said to him, go, your son live. Next, next thing, what he says. Go, your son will live. He hears Jesus. Step number two, the man believed the word. Faith will never change in your, never change anything in your life when you come here Sunday after Sunday and you hear it. You're hearing it now. You hear it week after week in the preaching and the teaching of God's Word. Preaching and teaching of God's Word. Not only do you have to hear it, but you have to believe it. In other words, this is true. I understand this. This is what God says to me. This is what God is saying to me today. And I believe that this message is for me. This truth is for me, my family, my life, what I need at this moment. And Jesus, I believe it. Jesus said, go. He heard it. And he's now, he says, believe, I believe what Jesus said, where he said, my son is going to be healed. Has he seen his son? No. You see, he's moved from I got to see it first to believe it. He's now believing Jesus, and he's not, he's not been home yet. He's not seen his son, but he's now he's believing Jesus at his word without the evidence because now he's beginning to understand who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing and what Jesus is all about is that he is the eternal Lord God Almighty. He believes. It doesn't end there. Official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke. And last part of verse 50. And he went on his way. He, what, what had Jesus told him to do? Go home. <laughs> What's he doing now? Going home. What's he not doing now? He's not dragging Jesus with him. Remember what he said before when he had his demands? His demand was Jesus my son will not be healed until you come with me physically to my house and heal my son. This is how it works. This is what I want you to do. Jesus, 
He's, what's he, he's trying to control Jesus like you would an idol. You know, you've got to have, I've got to have it right here. He's given all that up now. Jesus told him to go home. He's going home. He didn't, there's nothing there about asking Jesus to go with him because Jesus said, I don't have to go to your house. Your son is healed. He believes it. So now he's going home. But I want you to notice something else. Your son is dying. You've come to Jesus to ask him to heal your son. Now you hear that Jesus says to you, your son is healed. What would you think that someone might do at that moment? Man, I'm booking it home. You know, I, I got to go see this. Do you realize that he does not go home till the next day? When he goes sees the servant, he says to the servant, when did, when he says, your son is recovered. He says, when did it happen? He says, well, it was yesterday about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, 7th hour. Do you realize that this father, when he heard the word of Jesus, he obeyed the command of Jesus. He now went someplace, spent the night, and did not go home till the next day. You know why? Because he was now fully resting in his faith in Jesus. There was no hurry to get home. Jesus has spoken. I believe him. My son is well. I'll go home, spend a good night of rest, get home the next day. He gets there. Servant gives him report just as he believed, and his son is healed. You see, when you're trusting in Jesus Christ and you give your faith to him, and it's real, genuine faith, it's a resting faith. It is not... You know, am I going to make it to heaven? You know, have I done enough? Am I, doing, am I good enough? Have I gone to church enough? Have I been baptized enough? Have I done this, read my Bible enough? Have I done this? Am I, am I living? Am I, am I good enough, a good old boy? Have I been a good enough father? Have I not good enough dad? Have I done this and whatever? Then maybe I might make it to heaven one day, and I hope that I will. When you're trusting in Jesus Christ, and you're giving him your life, it's a rest. Share something with you folks. Some of you folks are tired. You know why you're tired? Because you've got a faith in Jesus that's trying to continue to work your way there. You get up on Sunday morning, I got to go to church today. Oh, you know, got to get my brownie points in with God this week. You know, I, you know, I... I guess I need to volunteer for ministry because that would be good. God kind of expects me to do that. But you know, I you know, I you know, go to church and serve and do all that stuff and whatever. And I, you know, vacation Bible school, you know, night all week long, every night, three hours a week with a bunch of kids, and I got work and I've got, you know, I okay, I'll grit my teeth and I'm gonna do it. You know what faith in Jesus is? Resting faith. I'm not saying that you, you get tired and we work and you, know, you work for Jesus. Don't misunderstand me. I don't work because I'm trying to earn something. I work because I love him. How many of you fathers have done a whole lot of work for your children? I mean, you've sacrificed. You've given time. I mean, watching your kid play t-ball, good night, give me a, you know, I, I've done it standing there going, you know, these outstanding the outfield and, you know, Henry's digging in the grass and he's playing here, ball comes over his head, has no clue what to do with it, but you're a good dad, you do that, you watch that, and you try to keep yourself from screaming and jumping in there and hit the ball. Grab the ball. They don't care. You've been to all those travel games and high school games and never seems to. And then they go off to college and you go off and you got all that stuff going on, whatever. You spend an enormous amount of time. Why'd you do it? No one was paying you because you loved them. You loved them. That's what Jesus wants us to do. I'm going to go home, spend a good night's rest. 
because I'm trusting him. Jesus has it taken care of. If some of you would twit, quit trying to be God, your life would have a whole lot more peace. Because you're trying to run your life. You're trying to fix all your problems. You're trying to do everything in your life. And it's a tiresome job to be God. God has all the resources to be able to do that. We don't. Rest in him. Lastly, there's the outcome of the miracle. We've seen this. Right this way right now, the product of faith. What happens? Well, what do we learn in the outcome? Here's some principles and we're done. The best place to bring the burdens you have about your family is to the only one who has the power to change things. The best place to bring the burdens about your family is to the only one who can change things. That's Jesus. You got a wayward son or daughter. You got some difficulties going on with your grandkids. You got a marriage that's not what it should be. What do you do with it? You bring them to Jesus. There's not a thing outside the walls of this building in this world that's going to help the problem that you got. None. The only person, the only power that can change that is through the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Number two, we learn that faith acts first and then sees the results. You believe it, then God will show you. You see, there's a song we sing here all the time. We'll sing it this morning. All to Jesus I surrender. You see, that's what Jesus wanted this father to do was to surrender to Jesus first. Then God would begin to work in his life. You see, God is much more interested in trying to fix your problem. If God just simply fixed your problem before he led you to faith, then you could, what we would do is that. Here's what we get. You get your problem fixed. Everything's doing okay. And then we go right back to the way we were living. Happens to people all the time. You see them in church because there's a problem. Things get a little bit better. They drop right out of church. God doesn't want to just simply fix your problem this morning. God wants to fix your heart. He wants to fix the root issue of the problem. Number three. We learn that the greatest miracle is spiritual and not physical. Notice what happens when the father goes back. He hears about his son. It says he believed, and then the household believes. The word that John used there, belief, is not that they mentally assent. It's the same as John 3, 16, for whosoever believeth in him. Now the father believes Jesus, not for the healing of his son, but he is believing Jesus, that Jesus he is the son of God. He is who he is, and he now believes and trusts in Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Your greatest need this morning is not for God to fix your marriage, to fix your kids, to fix your business, to fix your illness. To fix your mental problem. That's not God's, that's not the main thing that God wants to do in your life to that. That's simply something that's happened in your life to bring you to the greatest crisis of your life. And the greatest crisis of your life this morning is if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you die that way, you will go into a Christless eternity and you will go to hell. That's bigger than, that's the, you see, that's the biggest problem you and I ever face. Not a marriage problem, not a sickness problem, but a spiritual problem until you get that straight. That's the biggest issue. And that comes at the feet of Jesus. Then lastly, we learn that faith is courageous, contagious, excuse me, contagious. The father goes back, says he himself believed in all his household. Dad, let me share with you. How are you going to lead your faith, kids to faith in Christ? How are you going to lead your grand, grandkids to faith in Christ? You can't lead them somewhere you've not been. Let me say it again, dads. You can't lead your kids someplace you've not been. If you've not been to the foot of the cross, and if you've not believed in Jesus first, you see how it happened? He believed, and then his household believed. 
You want to lead your son to faith in Jesus Christ? Then, Dad, you surrender the Lord Jesus Christ, and you believe and you trust in him. And then you will see the results of that, that your son and your daughters will see your genuine faith in the Lord, and they will want what you want. You see, it can't be God. I just want my son to be good, and if I can get him in church and he can have the right, you know, good people around him or whatever, then maybe church will be good on him and he'll help me because I, you know, he's a discipline problem. Dad, you better come to Jesus first, and the greatest thing that your child needs is not some discipline. The greatest thing your child needs is to come to Jesus Christ and get their heart right with God. You don't know where rebellion teenagers comes from, but rebellion comes from teenagers who don't know Jesus. And many teenagers don't know Jesus because their dads don't know Jesus. Or they've met Jesus and they have a lip knowledge about Jesus, but they don't live for him. They don't surrender their life to him. Faith that is genuine is contagious. And I'm telling you, there's some marriages, and there's some homes, and there's some sons, and there's some daughters, and there's some grandkids who could come to faith in Jesus Christ, and there should be some households that could be totally changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ if there were the surrender of some dads today who come before Jesus and say, Jesus, I believe you. I trust in you. I give you my life. I surrender my life to you. And then you begin to watch God work in your life. Quit trying to manipulate God and tell him, to do, tell him how to do his business. God's business says, you surrender first, then I'll work. Where are you today? What's led you here? What's the difficulty or thing that's going on in your life today that Jesus has led you to this moment? And he's leading you to a genuine faith in Jesus today. We're all you on the journey. Maybe just the beginning point. Maybe at the problem point. Maybe where the, you're beginning to truly trust him. Or maybe it's that point where you really begin to see God work in your life and you fully committed to him. Just as I am without one plea. That's how you come. Plea means you don't give anything. It's just me. Let's pray. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, speak to hearts today. Father, I pray that you'd speak to our dads today, especially. Or this message and this miracle of Jesus is a, an encouragement. You see how that Jesus had a divine appointment to come to this place to meet this dad on this day. The dad came to Jesus just looking to have his son healed, but ended up with his son healed and his heart healed and his son saved and all of his household saved and trusting in Jesus. And this man with this family today is in heaven because he trusted Jesus. Are you willing to trust Jesus today and surrender to him without stipulation, without conditions, and to say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you? Father, I pray there'll be many fathers, sons, daughters, men and women who pray a simple prayer of faith today. Lord Jesus, I trust you as my Savior. I believe that you are the eternal Son of God who died upon the cross of Calvary. Forgive me of my sins. Trust you today. There will be many who will come into the kingdom of God today. Families changed. Lives changed. Sons and daughters changed. There are some dads who come to genuine faith in Jesus today. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.